Welcome to Rex's Bible Man, a weekly video where we talk about Jesus, Christianity, and anything along those lines. Uh, we're in week 27 of our study of Revelation, um, and it's we're getting close. We're getting closer and closer to the end. We're actually, at this point, we're going to be seeing how things are starting to wrap up. Um, so we're going to be in chapter 16. We're going to get through all of it today, hopefully. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll learn a little bit uh, about God's ultimate rescue plan for humanity. Um, a couple of things, as always, we want to make sure I put ourselves back in the train of thought. Uh, Revelation, written by John the Apostle, most likely, or one of his disciples named John. Um, it was written to a group of Christians who were suffering at the hands of an oppressive uh, empire, at the hands of institutions of, of man that are basically what John describes as, as tools of, of Satan, tools of the devil, uh, to oppress people, to to carry out suffering and misery, and to separate people from God. Um, last week we talked about how uh, judgment is a good thing, right? That was that was what chapter 15 essentially was about. It was about the beginning of this final septenary, we'll talk about that in a second, and about how we need judgment, that if wrongs are committed, you need a judge to come in and, and make things right. And that's what God ultimately is going to do, is, is the wrongs that have happened in this world, the evils, the, the atrocities, the, the, the systems and institutions that, that cause suffering, that God will come in and He will judge them and He will make things right. So judgment is a good thing. We have to be still in that part of our mind, be thinking that way as we study uh, chapter 16. Um, the last thing is we are now transitioning to the final septenary. So Revelation is written... Uh, with three what we call septenaries, which is a fancy word for sets of seven. And these are the same vision, just from three different angles, because there's three different messages communicated for each one. Um, but essentially, they these septenaries, the seals, the trumpets, and now the bulls, they are God's rescue plan being put into action. And they all consist of basically the same thing. Evil is, is exposed. It is allowed to do what it is going to do, because... It needs to be exposed, and then once it is fully exposed, it is finally dealt with. Um, and then we'll see in this uh, septenary especially that it's it's much more than just evil in broad general terms the way the, the first two septenaries were. This one, you re it really, we break down the layers. We see that the, the local folks, the local people that are the tools of the devil are dealt with, the empire level is dealt with, and then the source of all the evil, Satan himself, is finally dealt with. So let's go ahead and read chapter 16. We'll read verses 1 through 9 first, uh, deal with it, and then we'll break down the last section. So let's get into this. This is John speaking. He says, Then I heard a loud voice coming from the temple, the temple in heaven, that is, addressing the seven angels who have the seven bowls. Off you go, said the voice, and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of God's anger. So the first one went off and poured out his bowl on the earth. And foul, painful sores came on the people who had the mark of the monster and those who worshipped its image. If you're confused about that or this is your first time hearing that or you think this is something great, like go back and watch uh, my, my study on that. Right? It's important that you understand what those actually are. Okay? The second one poured it was bowl on the sea and it turned into blood like that from a corpse. Every living thing in the sea died. The third one poured his bowl in the rivers and the springs of water, and they turned into blood. And then I heard an angel of the waters saying, You are the one who is and who was. You are the Holy One. You are just. You have passed the righteous sentence. They spilt the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, your judgments are true and just. Remember the, the, the martyrs that are under the altar from chapter 4 and 5? Then the angel poured his bowl upon the sun, and it was allowed to burn the people with its fire. People were burned up by its great heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues. They did not repent or give him glory. So we're seeing in these first four bowls, these plagues, number one, they're... they're, they're John is is playing off of the, the plagues of Egypt, something that he's done a lot throughout Revelation. Um... But essentially, we're, we're seeing wrath here, and we're seeing wrath in a new way, um, kind of. The first septenaries, it was a third of the people, or a third of the fish, or it was a portion of this, or a quarter, or a, you know, it was partial. With these, we're seeing everything. It says all the fish in the sea died, all the rivers turned to blood, all the springs turned to blood, like... There's something different about these bulls. What is the message that is being communicated that's different from the other two? 
It's that God's work is, is complete. It is thorough. But it's also a message about wrath. And it kind of goes hand in hand with that judgment. That's why I made sure I brought up the judgment thing we talked about last week. About how the wrath of God... Uh, when you say it like that, you almost can't help but say it, like the wrath of God. Like, you know, like you, you, you use it, it's been used as a fear tactic and everything else for so long. But the, the reality is the wrath of God has to be severe. Or else it has no teeth, right? Um, Richard Niebuhr, a uh, famous theologian, um, he he did a study on this, um, and he was commenting on uh, the liberal branches of, of Christianity that were so rampant in his day, uh, and and the cause the the harm that they were causing, and he said that essentially their theology boils down to this. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministration of a Christ without a cross. See, if you take away the wrath of God, that that there is a hell, that there is a, a division between God's people and those who aren't God's people, that there is separation there, and that separation is eternal. And what it means to be not part of God's people, what that means you have chosen, what that means you are doing, if, if there's no wrath, there's no separation. And if there's no separation, what did Christ come for? See, God's wrath essentially consists of two things. Like, we think of it like, you know, maybe like a, the, the Hercules movie where the Zeus, like, smites people. Like, no, like, wrath of God consists of two things. First is that he allows human wickedness to reap its own destruction. I mean, if you look at from a, a systemic scale, you look at the communist systems, the poorest country in the world, who you see they're full of corruption, they're full of greed and, and evil. Look at Haiti, it's a failed state. Look at North Korea, it's a failed state. Like we look at these places where where systemic evil is allowed to run rampant and to control things and they're awful. You look back to the 21st century under the Mao Zedong days or uh, under communist Russia. I mean, those the, they killed millions and millions of people until they collapsed or had to change. Human and evil, it, it, it destroys itself. And God's wrath consists of, number one, allowing them to do so. But it also consists of God stepping in when things get out of hand. And so we see both in these first four plagues. We see both that, that God is just simply allowing evil to run its course and destroy itself, and we're also seeing him stepping in and changing things. And so we see with these first four bowls that, that God is, is, is carrying out his execution, his judgment on, on the world. And he's beginning to do away with the corruption, to do away with the evil. When I say corruption, I don't think of like, you know, like somebody who's just scheming and, and taking, you know, bribes and stuff. I mean the corruption of creation. God created everything to be one way, and he created it to look this way and act this way. He has standards for everything. That's, that's essentially what sin is. Sin is not living up to those standards. But wrapping up in, in Revelation 21, God here is beginning the process of purifying creation. The old is done away with. Everything that is corrupted, everything that is broken, everything that isn't up to God's standards is done away with. The things that are, they survive. God's people. But we're seeing that God is beginning the process of doing away with the old so that he can bring in the new. And so let's read uh, the rest of Revelation chapter 16, starting in verse 10. It says, Then the fifth angel poured his bull upon the throne of the monster. Its kingdom was plunged into darkness, and people chewed their tongues because of the pain and cursed the God of heaven because of their agonies and their terrible sores. They did not repent of what they had been doing. All right, so we see the next angel poured on the throne of the monster. What is the monster? What is the beast? Well, that is empire. we got to remember that. And so this is God carrying out execution he's carrying out wrath on empire on systems that corrupt and destroy and kill and murder and abuse that's he's carrying it out here and he says that even even with this there is no repentance it's one of the things we're seeing in this this septenary is that there's not much repentance that the time is kind of up 
Verse 12, Then the sixth angel poured his bowl in the great river Euphrates, and its waters was dried up in order to prepare the way for kings from the rising sun. Then I saw three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the monster, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And they were like frogs. Again, the Exodus, ten plagues. These were the spirits of demons who performed signs to, and go off to the kings of the whole earth to gather them together for war on the great day of Almighty God. So, a couple things here. Number one, Euphrates. What is Euphrates? The Euphrates was the dividing line between east and west as John was writing this. It was the dividing line, essentially, between the Persian empires and the Roman empires. It was the defensible line between the two. Well, if that river dries up, the armies can go marching across. There's nothing blocking them. There's no defensive line. They now can come together for war. And so we see this happen, and, and what God is, what we're seeing here is that the evil is, is allowed to finally wage its war on God that it thinks it can win. And out of the unholy trinity, the dragon, the monster, the false prophet, you know, these, the, you, the empire, the devil, and, and the local uh, people who are lifting up the empire, those who have the mark, and et cetera, et cetera. Again, go back and watch that week. Um, they, they come out, and these, these are the ones that go about and, and, and the, the spirits that, that, that push people to rebel against God. This is Satan's influence in the world. Uh, and again, he, he's pulling on uh, the ten plagues. With it, with it showing them as looking like frogs. I mean, it kind of is like, it, think of this like uh, the build up to war, right? Anytime there's a big war, you see the newspapers, uh, and well, maybe not so much newspapers anymore, but you see, you know, social media and the news. Like people are constantly hopping around, pushing, you know, this opinion or that opinion, and public opinion sways back and forth. Like that, that's what the frogs represent essentially is that is that that attitude that happens within humanity of the build up, the 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 the, the making t your, yourself ready to accept whatever it is. This war, like you, that's the bad guy. We got to go fight them. That's that's essentially what's happening here. And then John in verse fifteen inserts this thing. Uh, it's essentially like, you know, catching your buddy in class. Uh, I love the way that uh, Tom Wright in his commentary, you know, uses the illustration of, you know, professor falling asleep and then being called upon to answer a question, having no idea what's going on. He gets jabbed in the elbow and says, wake up. That's, that's what's going on here in verse 15. He says, look, I'm coming like a thief in the night. This is Jesus talking. God's blessing on the one who stays awake and those who keep their robes about them so as not to go around naked and have their shame exposed. I mean, we're getting to the end of Revelation. And at this point, it's like... It could be really easy to just be like, yeah, the bad people are going to get it. The good people are going to be saved. But it's like, no, you have to pay attention. You have to stay awake. You can't just be like, yep, we're good. Like, no, you've, you've got you to gotta stay up on this. you got to stay awake. you got to pay attention. Verse 16, he says, And they gathered the kings together in a place in Hebrew, which is called Mount Megiddo. Now, this is one of those things that those who are more of the left-behind bent of interpreting Revelation, like, yes, there's going to be one major battle. Mount Megiddo is the symbolic home of war. Um, and, and most people who study this know that. But just in case you didn't know, Mount Megiddo is where archaeologists are pretty sure the first major battle in history happened. It's the place where from ancient times people were like, yeah, that's the, that's the place of war, Megiddo. Um, it's in Palestine. Uh, w what John is doing is he's drawing out the war between good and evil. Right? That's what he's showing. He's saying that this war that evil is waging on God that is continuing on all the way back from when Satan rebelled in heaven and convinced the angels. The war continues on. This is part of that, that story. It's continuing that eventually evil will be exposed. It will wage itself. It will rise up and try to wage war against God. It's not meant to be a literal battle because the battle's already won. There's no fight. Jesus already won. He's already conquered. But that won't stop the kings of the earth. That won't stop the people, the empires, the institutions from trying to wage war against God. Verse 17 says, Then the seventh angel poured his bowl on the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. It is done, said the voice. And there were lightnings and rumblings and thunderclaps and a great earthquake such as there had never been before. No, not such a great earthquake since the time that humans came on the earth. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. Then Babylon the Great was recalled in the presence of God, so that he could give her up, give her the cup of wine of his anger. Every island fled away, the mountains disappeared, enormous hailstones weighing, each weighing a hundred pounds, fell from the sky on people, and they cursed God because of the plague of hail, and because of the plague was terrible. And so we see the seventh bowl, it is thrown up 
into the air, which if you are familiar, you know that 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 is the dwelling place of spirits, right? The ancient reader, the first century reader who would have read this would have immediately understood that this was being poured out on the realm of the spirits of of demons, of angels, like that. That's what the the world, their worldview was, that the air was full of spirits constantly. So this is being poured out on their kingdom. As a matter of fact, Satan is called the the prince of the power of the air uh, by Paul. So just that that's that's what's happening here. So essentially, there's judgment on on them. Finally, evil is finally being judged. The wrath of God is being poured out on Satan as well. And then, like we've seen in other places, anytime you see lightning, thunder. That's God. That's God working. God's doing something, right? It goes all the way back to Moses on Mount Sinai. Lightning, thunder, earthquakes. God's doing something. And then we see the great city split into three parts. What's the great city? Could be Rome. Could be Babylon. Could be Jerusalem. It's not really the point. Uh, the point is that it is destroyed. And with the great city, what, it, what I think it's Rome, is simply because what is what is God calling judgment on here? He's calling judgment on Satan, on his monster empire, and on those who support the monster. Well, what is the seat of empire at this point? It's Rome. So uh, I think that it essentially just the city is, is destroyed. That, and again, it's not that it is literally destroyed here. This is Evil being allowed to run its course, being called, and then being destroyed. And so we're seeing ultimate turmoil. We're seeing ultimate upheaval. We're seeing everything in every institution completely destroyed. Think back to communist collapse in 1989. Think back to apartheid collapse. Think back to all these different, when evil collapses under its own weight, when evil is finally dealt with, it's upheaval. It is colossal. It is biblical in its scale. And so that gets us to the end of chapter 16. And from here, we're going to start seeing how God finally wraps everything up, how he's going to make all things new. And then we'll see uh, Revelation 21, where we get to see how everything will be. So uh, I'm really excited about this last section of Revelation. It's my favorite part. Um, If you have any questions, reach out. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.